Good morning, St. James. Welcome to everyone gathered here in our tabernacle, multi-purpose room, but today it's a sanctuary. Uh, they have promised that, uh, eh, promised. They said that the part for the air conditioner would be here by the middle of July. We'll see. <laughs> We're hoping. It's getting closer to the middle of July, and I'm hoping closer to air conditioner. So uh, we are doing uh, communion today. This is Communion Sunday since it's the first uh, of the month, and so our prayer time will just be a little bit shorter. So those red folders uh, in front of you in the rows here and at the tables behind, they have the little blue cards in there. So if you want to start thinking about your prayer requests, your joys and concerns um, for today. But as we come together today, we're going we're gonna to focus on the story of Moses, especially with the ten plagues. And I'm going to suggest that we all face some plagues, some hardships, some difficulties, some things that uh, kind of toss us for a loop and how we might... Um, be our best selves, how we might respond to those uh, in a more Christian fashion. So think about some of those things maybe that are frustrating in life for you, and we'll see if we can uh, apply the good news to them uh, by the end of worship. So thank you for being here in person, online. Glad you're all here. Mamie, could you please bring us into worship? Thank you, Mamie. Please rise as you're able and join me in the call to worship. As we assemble here from the east and west, the north and south, <clears throat> let all the redeemed sing together in praise, rejoicing in the promises.
Please remain standing for our first hymn, number 697. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. take out the white cover to your uh, bulletin. We'll look at a few announcements for today. Uh, first, let me say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Last week, if you remember, uh, we were talking about the neighborhood uh, park, the party. We were going to do um, ice cream and, and reach out to our neighbors, and I forgot to put the sign up into the bulletin, and I pleaded with all of you. Twenty-five of you took pity on me, and you showed up at the park, so thank you. Uh, had about 25 church members and roughly 30 uh, neighborhood folks that we got to reach out and say hello to. Uh, there was a group of 10 young gentlemen who were playing basketball, and they loved the ice cream. They came back for seconds, <laughs> and thirds, <laughs> and fourths. And then uh, when we were all done and the uh, ice cream was melting, they came and actually cleared out all of the ice cream. <laughs> From, uh, from the cooler. So we, we reached out to, to the community, to our neighborhood, and uh, made some relationships. And so thank you for, for supporting that. Uh, second thing I want to say is uh, last week we talked about we're here. We need to, ref- we need to fix the ref- refrigerator. Oh, I'm having a Sunday morning. Pray for me. Air conditioner. And there are air conditioner issues here over at Franklin campus uh, with all of the rain and weather. There's water issues here and over at Franklin campus. Um, so we talked about the, the repair fund last week. Council has met. Council has decided uh, to try to get a handle on this. We're going to try to figure out all of those, what those issues are, how much they're going to cost. We will keep coming back to you with information. But I need to make something clear. Last week, um, I made the joke of saying that as you write that check out in the memo line, just make it to Eric's pool party. Somebody did that, actually. (laughs) And as I'm trying to be faithful with our church finances, that's not a good thing to have to take to the bank. So that was a joke. (laughs) But appreciate all of you who um, have supported or thinking about supporting that and repair, put repair (laughs) within that. Um, Other big piece. So in the white white thing that I asked you to all take out. Remember, we start in the top left. That's what's kind of most pressing and what's coming up, and then down to the bottom right for save the date. Top left is Vacation Bible School. And below that is Vacation Bible School. And below that is Vacation Bible School. Guess what's coming up real quick, folks? Vacation, Vacation Bible School. Uh, we, need, we have a sign-up for volunteers. Uh, they are meeting after worship today in order to decorate and on Wednesday uh, to get the plans together. Uh, If you need to sign up your kids, grandkids, um, anyone, please do that. 
Understand there's a tradition here. You get to go shopping. You all go onto the Amazon shopping list that is created. It's there, I've looked, um, and you can, you can help support BBS in that way. So just, and thank you to council. The, the different committees from council are serving different meals um, at Vacation Bible School. So this is a group, group effort. Um, also, we have so, this is a save the date for you all. We have so many new folks showing up this summer. We're going to do a new class, uh, a new member class in a couple of weeks. So save that date, okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll get to meet some new, some new family members soon. With that, good morning. Uh, let's move into our joys and concerns. I'll ask um, if anyone has blue sheets and if the ushers could collect those, please. Since we're doing uh, communion today, our, our joys and concerns will be uh, a little bit shorter. We'll gather all these up and um, we'll do these in a, in a pastoral prayer. But let me specifically share um, Pastor Robert Folkers, Bob Folkers, who was a um, previous pastor at St. James and around Nebraska, um, did conference ministries. Uh, we shared last week that he uh, had passed away, he, just shy of he and his wife's Connie's uh, 70th wedding anniversary. Um, his funeral will be this Friday, July 12th, at Trinity United Methodist Church, Ralston, at, I think, 11 o'clock. Thank you for verifying that. Okay, so 11 o'clock on Friday at Trinity in Ralston uh, for his uh, memorial service. So if we're not able to make it, I know that we'll be, be thinking about him and Connie um, as he uh, did his ministry here. It will be live streamed, and is that through the funeral homes site? Okay, thank you for. Perfect. So the funeral home here in town, their website. Go to his obituary. There's a link. It will be live streamed, in case you're not able to make it in person. Thank you for that information, man. With that, let's let's take this moment. Uh, kind of calm ourselves, clear our minds, um, share with God what is uh, personally on our hearts. I'll, I'll share what's um, in, our, in our blue prayer requests here, and then we'll, we'll end with a pastoral prayer. Gracious God, as we come before you this morning, Brenda offers uh, prayers of thanks for a granddaughter who completed a seven-hour surgery, uh, a three-year-old granddaughter who completed a seven-hour surgery, um, and she's up and running and playing, so thankful for, for that. Um, Diane offers uh, youngest grandchild, Annie, is to have surgery on Friday, or had surgery on Friday, had it this past Friday, um, to remove her adenoids and put tubes in her ears. And is she up and well and yet? Okay. Uh, and one of our youth wanted to make sure she announced this at 9.30 worship, but uh, uh, Abigail is 18 today. Big day for Abigail, so if you see her, wish her, wish her happy birthday. So, gracious God, we bring these to you. We know that there are, are more in our hearts. Um, some of them are celebrations, and we, we are just thankful for you being in our lives, part of our lives, moving in our lives. And some of them are more heavy. Maybe roadblocks we've hit, frustrations. God, in this, in this time of prayer, I would offer all of us just to take in that deep breath.
remind us that this is the very breath of God. This is this is the breath that gives us life. This is what reminds us that we are loved, that we are children of God, and that we are people of worth. And then we can breathe out whatever stressful and hand that to God. To breathe out anxiety. To breathe out frustrations. To breathe out those prayers. We ask God to, to help, to support, and to fix. God, all these things we give to you today. us to continue to worship. Good morning. It's not a tiny guitar. It's a really big ukulele. So. And the river will open for the righteous, and the river will open for the righteous someday. I was walking with my brother, and he wondered how I am. Said, oh, what I believe in my soul ain't what I see with my eyes, and there's no turning back this time. I am a patriot, and I love my country, because my country is all I know. want to be with my family, people who understand me, and there's no place I'd rather go. And the river will open for the righteous, and the river will open for the righteous, and the river will open for the righteous someday. I was walking with my girlfriend. She looked so fine, fine. I said, baby, what's on your mind? She said, I want to like the lions, release from the cages, release from these rages, burn in my soul tonight I am I am I am I am a patriot and I love my country cause my country is all I know wanna be with my family people who understand me and there's nowhere left to go and the river will open for the righteous and the river will open for the righteous and the river will open for the righteous someday 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 Thank you. Please rise as you're able for the reading of today's scripture, taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. Your brother Aaron will be the one who speaks for you. You will speak all that I tell you. Your brother Aaron will tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his land. But I will make Pharaoh's heart hard. 
So I will do many powerful works for the people to see in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt. By great acts that will punish the Egyptians, I will bring out my family groups, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I put my hand upon Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So Moses and Aaron did what the Lord told them to do. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. This ends the reading of today's scripture. Thank you. You may be seated. I guess the question then should be, is there anyone here who's over the age of 83? You get to retire, but only you. All of us are still having to work into our 80s for that. Thank you for reading that scripture for us. I told uh, some of the youth earlier that I was really jealous that I didn't get to go on the youth mission trip with them. Not for the fact of getting to sleep on a concrete church floor. Not for the fact of having to work really, really hard in the heat during the middle of the day. Those, those, that's not what I was talking about. What I really like about youth trips specifically and mission trips is the road trip to get there and back. I like the road trips. I like being able to to turn up the radio, sing karaoke at the top of my lungs. I didn't say it was singing well, just that I sang loudly. I like being, being there with, with family and friends. I mean, you're in the car. You're there together. Um, do anybody remember as a kid, did you play the, the alphabet game? The license plate game? Okay, kids today don't know those. Do you know those? Yeah, she's going, eh, I don't know those. Um, so... But the whole point of really a road trip, the, the, the piece de resistance, junk food, right? I mean, that's just what you eat the whole time. And you stop. You don't stop for a rest stop. You stop when you run out of junk food. That's when you stop. So my most recent uh, road trip happened a couple years ago, was moving uh, from Seattle back home to the Midwest, was going to land in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and along that, that road trip, in that journey, suddenly from the back seat, I hear those four words, are we there yet? And then I heard, I'm hungry. And then the four words that I fear, I might be sick. Boy, traveling in that left lane, getting over to the right as quickly as possible. <laughs> Don't like those, those four words at all. Um, I have had road trips where uh, blew out a tire, had a flat, and had to change it myself because AAA wasn't coming. Had another time uh, where I rented a car for an excursion, and the uh, gas gauge was broken and ran out of gas. I only drive my own from now on. But the, this one uh, was when I was moving out to Seattle. I actually blew up an engine, slipped the timing belt. That was a $7,000 plague. Didn't like that one at all. But on, on this particular road trip that I'm talking about, so from Seattle to, to Madison, um, again, I like road trips. I'm good at planning road trips. I know where we're going to stop and what we're going to do and where all the pit stops are, what, everything that we need. And yet, even on this trip, we missed a key exit. We ran into some construction that gave us a detour that took us about three hours out of our way. And in that detour, suddenly the GPS gave out and though we were supposed to be driving east, I the car said we were driving southwest. 
I don't know how we made it because all throughout this road trip that I had planned so well, things kept plaguing me. And let me tell you, the whole time, I was not my normal chipper self. <laughs> my best self did not show up uh, in the midst of that. So as everything is, is spinning out of control, it feels like it's on the verge of chaos. Um, we are plagued by problems. Do you see what I'm doing here? I keep saying plague, plague, plague. You read about plagues today. So we want to talk about the ten plagues within our story. So for Moses um, and the people of the Hebrews that were talking about how to get out of Egypt and traversing the, uh, the wilderness to get to the promised land, that is our sermon series for this summer. Uh, but today, what you read for us was the very beginning of the plagues. So the plagues take up multiple chapters, but I want to I give you just a bit of a context that we can then jump from. So these ten plagues, these, question, these are not trick questions, okay? Ten plagues, have you heard in any other place in Exodus where maybe Moses went up on a mountaintop, got two pieces of stone, and there were ten commandments? Very, very good, okay? Okay. Um, Within uh, Genesis chapter 1, as creation is happening, so God said, you know, let there be light. There's one. Separating heavens from the earth, there's two and three. Guess how many different steps or stages there are in the creation story in Genesis chapter 1? Ten, very good. But, But people find themselves in Egypt. Egypt, the religion of Egypt has... Not just one god, but major gods. Maybe you've heard of Ra, Osiris, Isis, um, Horus. Um, but in, in the Egyptian religion, there are how many major gods within the Egyptian religion? I told you, folks, this was not a trick question. This is not numerology, but there is a connection between all of these that the biblical authors use. So the context is, in this, the ten plagues, they are one at a time. The authors are using the ten plagues to kind of undo, decreate, reverse what God did in those six days. And basically of, well, the biblical authors are looking at them and going... Our God's better than your God. (laughs) So one plague for each of the major gods within Egyptian religion. So that that chaos, that that decreation that is happening doesn't come all at once, but rather it's one day, one plague, focusing on one of the Egyptian gods. Again, in a way to say, our one God is so much more powerful than all your ten gods put together. This is, as the Hebrews would have read this story or told this story around the campfire, they would have understood this connection between the plagues and creation and the other gods. And ours is better. Na, 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 na. But I want to take today the plagues and use that as the launching off point, not just for road trips and how we have plagues, but I want to use plagues as that metaphor to say we are all plagued in life with things that don't go well. They don't go according to plan. I want something to happen and it doesn't happen. You and I have a conversation, and I want you to agree with me. And you refuse to agree with me. All of these, what I'm going to call plagues, offer us an opportunity to decide whether or not we are going to react versus respond. Now, here's what I don't know when I was introduced. I don't know if this was said or if you heard this or if you remember this. 
but somebody in this room has a PhD in behavioral psychology, and it's me. <laughs> so I want to present to you this morning my dissertation research. I want to share with you that I have found a way that, that is based in theory, so it's solid, and it passes the empirical test, which means we've tested it, I've done the math, and it works out. But also, it is grounded in the Bible. It is grounded in practices that Jesus calls us to do on a daily basis. And I want to gift it. You don't have to, you don't have to go out and wait for me to, to, to write the book and become a New York Times bestseller. You don't have to wait. You don't have to sign up and take my class. Just take out the insert. And it's here. It's for you. It's free. Okay? I just want to share with you how do we, when we are plagued in our lives, in our families, in our relationships, in our work, in our church, when we are plagued, we have an opportunity not to react, but instead to respond. So let's start. How, how many of you uh, watched, do you remember the um, sitcom Friends? I know it's old, I'm dating myself, right? Do you remember the character Ross Geller? Okay, so in this scene, if you remember, Ross is, Ross is having a, an, an issue. He's being plagued with stress because he has to have a double date with Rachel and Joey. Now, if you remember, Rachel, his girlfriend, the one that he's loved since you know, high school, and Joey, his best friend. And so in this scene, he comes out of the kitchen. He has made a pan of enchiladas. He's taken it straight out of the oven. He has no oven mitts on, and he's holding the, 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 the plate, hot plate of enchiladas, and, and his voice is getting higher and squeakier, and, and they just ask him, you know, Ross, are you okay? And he's like, I'm fine. Really, I'm fine. I don't know what's wrong with my voice. I'm fine. Shift scenes. This comes from a movie, uh, The Italian Job, the newer version. Uh, so Mark Wahlberg and his mentor, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, are thieves, art thieves, and they're getting ready for their next job. And the mentor looks at the younger uh, thief, the mentee, and says, how are you feeling? And Mark Wahlberg says, I'm fine. And the two of them look at each other, and in unison they say, you know what fine stands for, right? Freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> How many people here today are fine? <laughs> I'm going to tell you that um, according to research, most of us are fine. And by fine, I mean fine. We're not fine. We are reactive. The big word, you don't, you don't have to remember the academic words, I only tell them to you so that way I can puff myself up to let you know that I have a PhD. It's the only reason I say that, okay? The term is self-differentiation. What it means is our level and our capability to be able to manage that stress and that anxiety. Some of us manage it better than others. We learn this, how to, man, how, to, how to take care of our stress and manage all that. We learn that from our families. Some of you grew up in wonderful families, and you have a high level of differentiation, and you handle life pretty well. You're, you're more than fine. You're good. Others of us grew up in eh, dysfunctional families, and by others, I mean all of us grew up in dysfunctional families. And so we struggle with that, that kind of reactivity. You know, somebody, somebody says something that upsets you, so you snap right back at them. Somebody, you're, I don't know who this would be, but you're driving from the Franklin campus to the K-Park campus on a Sunday morning, and you're late for 9.30 worship, and somebody cuts you off in the middle of traffic, and I react. Not my best self. Not who I'd want to be in front of you all, live streamed. So, 
according to the theory, we can measure that level of self-differentiation. We can measure that level of how well we do with stress. And most people fall on a scale of zero to 100. Most people fall below 50. Most people fall around the number of 10. Most of us are just fine. Most of us are reactive. Most of us live life out of that, ooh, you, you cross me, I'll cross you. You say that to me, I'll say that to you. That's where most of us live. Even healthy people, self-differentiated people, healthy people who can manage their emotions only can do it half the time, according to research. See, I always say that because somebody looks at me and goes, I don't agree with that. And I'm like, fine, it's research, it's science. If you don't agree with it, you're wrong. That's why I love quoting research. Most people, so let's get into this. Most people are reactive, knee-jerk. We do the, have you heard of fight or flight? They've now added freeze and fawn. So the options are, you can fight. You and I, we disagree. I'll dig my heels in. I'm going to win, no matter what. Other people see that coming, and they're like, go the other way. I just, I'll avoid conflict at all costs. That's how they react. The fight, flight, freeze is ostrich putting the head in the sand. If you just ignore it long enough, maybe it'll go away. My mom told me that while I was growing up. Finally left for college. Or there's the fawn. This is my default. Just keep everybody happy. If you're upset, but I can keep you happy, then I'll be happy. The struggle is, is that if I keep you happy, you disagree with him and you're not happy. And so if I keep you happy, that means I'm not keeping you happy. So if I keep you happy, then I'm not keeping you happy. And that's when I dig in my heels, heels and start to fight. So we, all, we, we can do all of them, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. We can do all of them, but we tend to go with one of them. I won't ask you to identify yourself. It's easier to identify it in the person sitting next to you. You've already done it, I know. They always do it that way, right? They always respond that way. But those are, those are the places, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. What if I told you that there was a different way, that there was a better way, and that we could get out of that emotional reactivity, and that we could actually live into our best selves? And by best self, I mean the person that God created you to be. And we can, get, we can get from there to here four easy steps. They are quick. They're about six, these exercises are about 60 seconds long, each one of them. Based, did I say that they were based in theory, empirically validated? That means I did the math. Yeah, apparently um, I need a little more pat on the back today because I keep talking about my PhD. <laughs> So, here's, here's the four. When we face that plague, something doesn't go your way. There's a problem. You're frustrated. First thing you need to do, now it's on the back of the insert, if you want to cheat ahead. First thing you need to do is just breathe. Everybody, take a deep breath. Now let me ask the question, how many deep breaths do you think it takes to get from anxious and stressed to best self? Wrong, it's only three. <laughs> Thanks for letting me set you up. It's only three, three deep breaths, that is enough time to just, to pause. Do you remember in scripture where it says, be still and know that I am God? that we are to pray unceasingly at all times. I love the trivia that when an angel shows up, the first thing the angel says is what? Do not fear. Be not afraid. Pause. Three deep breaths. 
maybe you had, did you ever have someone tell you that when you get angry, you're supposed to count to 10? You only got to count to five. Three deep breaths, count to five, maybe find your pulse and just wait until your pulse slows down a bit. That's the first step, and it takes 60 seconds. By the way, did I say this was part of my PhD research? E. E means that we need to explore our values. What is it? In the midst of what is going wrong, what is it that I am passionate about that I must carry forward? What do I value in life? What do I value in the relationship? What do I value from my education or my job or um, within? A, what is it that you value? Some of you have noticed that over the last three months since I have been here, at the end of every worship service, I keep telling you the one thing, the first thing, the main thing, or the three things. Those are, in case you missed it, God loves you. You're a cog pal. You're a child of God and a person of worth. And we are called to go love our neighbors. Guess what those are? Values. It's like I've been brainwashing you. I mean manipulating you. I mean motivating you the entire time. Because, and someone actually, a few of you came up to me and you started sharing stories from, well, yes, I learned that when, when I was in grade school or in preschool, you know, the song Jesus Loves Me, that's all I know. That was supposed to be a joke, but wasn't funny, obviously. Some of, some of you have come to me and said, that's, that's kind of basic, isn't it? It's kind of elementary. And my response has been, or is it foundational? Because there's a difference. Sure, basic. Jesus loves me. It's all I've got to know. But there are some people in this world who don't even know that. And if we don't know that foundational value, we're a Kiwanis club. Find that value that you're going to hold on to. Then we can move. All of that is the, the inside stuff. Intra, psychic. That's what's happening inside of us. But then there's stuff that's happening between us. So we move to the S. That means to step back. Big word is distancing. It's just kind of take a step back, distance yourself, ask that question. Well, okay, you and I are arguing. Why are you wrong? Better question of, what might you be thinking? What are you feeling? What is that person's perspective? Because if that perspective is different than mine, we're starting at two different places. We may be talking about the same thing, but we're coming at it from different directions. That doesn't make one right and one wrong. It just makes it different. So if we can step back and actually view the other person as a cog pal, that changes everything. Because you know what happens if we don't see each other as cog pals. I know God loves me, but if I don't think that God loves you, you know what I am? Hitler. If I don't see the value in you like I see the value in me, then i got to take a step back and reassess. Because it's not about me. It's about the relationship. So, in Scripture it says, love your neighbor and pray for your enemies. Do you know why those two phrases always show up together? It's because it's the same person. The person that we love as our neighbor is also the person that drives us nuts. And so we've got to take a step back. Be in their shoes for a bit. So finally we get to T, which means try again. Jesus said, if they make you walk a mile, go two. If they take your coat, give them the shirt. If they slap you on one side of the face, turn the other cheek. Try again and again and again because the goal is not to be right. The goal is to be in relationship. My least favorite line in scripture is when Peter goes to Jesus and says, how many times do I have to forgive? 
Seven times seven, perfect number times perfect number, which means I have to forgive perfectly. And Jesus goes, no, 70 times seven, perfect to infinity. That's hard to do. But that's what we're called to. So let's wrap this up. I love it. Even this morning, some folks have come and asked questions of, you know, okay, we've got the answer. You know, who do we tell? You know, how do we, how do we make all of this happen? And of going, it starts with you. And it starts with me. It really comes down to that point of, of having to understand that the Christian walk, what Jesus is teaching us, if I might borrow, the main thing Jesus never tells us to be right. Jesus tells us to be in relationship. When I'm anxious and I'm stressed, I go to being right. But for my best self, I can show up in different ways. I don't know where it's coming from. It's got to be a God thing. Because I can interact with people on a better, on a different level. The other piece is to understand that for we as Christians, we have been taught so much that the end goal is peace. Have peace at all costs. Peace. Avoid the conflict. Peace. You know what that's called? Flight. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that the end result will be peace. What it asks us to do is that if I show up as my best self and you show up as your best self, even though we still might not agree, even though we might have different perspectives, we will still honor and respect. The relationship will be intact. And from that, the result, the end point, the nice icing on the cake is that peace happens. See, peace is a gift from God after we do what God calls us to do. Take a deep breath. Know that you are loved and that you are a person of worth. Whoever you are thinking of right now, they are a person of worth as well. And we have the call to go and try again. I wonder if Pharaoh knew about my research, maybe he wouldn't have had so many plagues to deal with. Let us be in a spirit of prayer as we come for communion. We're on page number nine in the blue hymnals in front of you. So on page nine, so it's normally up on all of our screens. If you can respond in the bold face type, you might have it memorized already, but words are there in case you need it. So, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love for you failed, your love for us remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made a covenant with us to be our sovereign God and you spoke to us through your prophets, the first being Moses. And so today with your people here on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join together in the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ.
Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you've given birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took some bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is the bread of life. This is my body given for you. Sustenance for the journey. Remember me whenever you eat. And after supper, he took the cup, again gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, this is the cup of a new covenant. A cup of life that is filled with with the very blood that is shed from me on the cross. As often as you eat and you drink, remember me. And so today as we remember these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we want to offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving so that we can be a holy and living sacrifice in union with what Christ offered for us. So now together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your people gathered here, on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ who has been redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory and all of your children can feast together at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. With those assisting with communion, please come forward at this time, and then we will sing together the Lord's Prayer. three lines. This is not our table. It's not my table. It's not St. James's table, but this is, this is God's table, Christ's table, and all are welcome. You do not need to be uh, a member of St. James, confirmed in the United Methodist Church, even baptized. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing that there's an alternative to all of those plagues, and life with God can be lived differently, so you are invited to come. Our ushers will Help guide us uh, down this center aisle. Remember, we've got a camera here. Um, Don't accidentally nudge it. We'll come down the center aisle, uh, receive the bread for me, and then you can split um, to receive the grape juice baskets on either side. We will do communion, then we'll do offering, and then we'll do our last hymn. I think I got all of our instructions. Please come.
Let us stand our last hymn. Same page as before, 696, same place. Uh, we'll do verses 1, 2, and 3. times when you need to pause, breathe, take a step back, try again. Feel free to repeat them with me as you know them. The first one is? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. God loves you. The God who created you is head over heels for you. So the second one is that you are a cog pal. You are a child of God and a person of worth. And now we are called, the third, to go into the world and love our neighbors. But we're doing it as our best selves. Notice I didn't say perfect selves, our authentic selves, or even our Christian selves. Just our best selves, who God created you to be. Let's go serve. Amen.